Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namobia, our little show where we introduce you to a couple of topics and introduce you to a couple of holiday ideas, hopefully. And then at the end, we also have to the point. So it will be, first up, it will be topics. Uh, my name is Frank Steffen. I'm the editor of the Allgemeine Zeitung and then obviously responsible for Tourismus Namobia. Uh, that's why you see me here. And uh, like I said, welcome and let's have a look at the topics. Welcome back and uh, let's dive into these do topics. Uh, first up, I've got Recon Africa, not my choosing theirs, uh, because the audacity which they have at the moment is, is quite unbelievable. Uh, but it, it is um, quite clearly a, a case of the, company, the Canadian gas and exploration company Reconnaissance Energy Africa, we know as Recon Africa, seems to try and deceive the Namibian public and the international community, in fact. Um, it astonishes uh, critics, um, as well as activists and environmental experts. And uh, the Namibian state is just uh, looking on and doing nothing. So this is the original best practices document that they provided for seismic, uh, uh, for their seismic activities and measuring that they wanted to do in the Kavango. Um, so if we now uh, focus onto it, you will see that they said 95% uh, of the Recon Africa survey will be performed on existing roads and tracks. Now that's quite important because that by, um, yeah, you need to uh, assume from that statement that uh, only 5% will be done uh, through the woods. And uh, we ourselves obviously went up to Kavango a couple of times and time and again we proved that uh, they actually moved through these areas for, for a much greater distance than only 5% of the whole measuring uh, um, exercise. Now, uh, now, just in the past week, they basically removed this page and updated it, if you want to call it. So if we look at the next slide, you will see that it is different now. It's got a different picture on, but look at this suddenly the 95% has been removed. And they were clearly uh, under, you know, there was a lot of criticism for them moving beyond the 5% uh, uh, that they had promised. But uh, instead of just admitting it, they simply changed the document. My, my question is obviously, so you've changed the document, does that change the fact? Because, I mean, these best, best practices were the basis on which the environmental impacts uh, assessment was made. That was the basis uh, used for actually allowing them to do the seismic uh, operation. And they've just cut a whole lot of uh, uh, so-called fire breaks up there. Um, and funny enough, these fire breaks are all along the seismic uh, line. Now, when I was up there uh, previously, uh, people assured me that no, 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 we don't need those fire breaks where they plan on doing them. And so Recon Africa keeps on lying to us. Here you can see originally this was part of their first proposal and clearly non-conventional. It was the big thing and they always referred back to the Sproul report and uh, that was supposed to be the leading Canadian reservoir engineering firm if you can read the right at the bottom. And the Sproul report would have been the basis why there is this huge find and, and uh, um, uh, so clearly fracking would have been part of it because non-conventional boils down to fracking. Um, so, so lying seems to be uh, the name of the game. Um, and uh, so I'll, I quickly took out this uh, video. This was one of the videos which we made. You can just uh, make out the uh, spur of their vehicle that they had uh, which moved thr through these forested areas. These are protected areas. And if you focus uh, clearly onto some of those pictures, you will literally see where they simply took uh, uh, trees out of their way um, so that they can do their seismic assessment. 
This is a, a, a two-spur, uh, um, yeah, a road. It's not a road. It's it's just a track, and uh, we followed it right into these uh, bundus, and uh, just to prove that uh, there was no spur previously. And the spur actually ends right at the back, suddenly in the middle of nowhere, and then they returned on that. So clearly, it's not an existing road because where it ends, that's where it ends. There is no continuation of the spur to any uh, further destination and along the way we didn't uh, pass people who had their crawl there or whatever so clearly this is far beyond what uh, um, what they had promised and and we did this for a couple of times so this I just added for 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 as a reference point um, we had a number of places where we drove along those types of roads Anyway, so that's Recon Africa for you. If the EIA doesn't suit your purpose or if the, the facts don't uh, suit your purpose, you simply change them. Um, so up next, we've got uh, Palkis. Uh, Palkis, for those uh, of you from overseas, it's a favored fishing spot at the Namibian coast. And here you can see on the past weekend, the so-called Kabulyo run was the big thing. Kabulyo obviously starts uh, migrating at this uh, time of year. Normally it's actually later, it's in January, uh, end of January, beginning of February, but this year it started much earlier. And um, so all that I can hope for is that people truly just go and angle and, and fish and enjoy the, the sport and, and do not go overboard again, as we saw a couple of years ago, when people were literally filling trailers by the dozen and, and carting off the fish. And then at the end of the day, we're surprised when the Ministry of Environment, uh, Forestry and Tourism just calls a stop to it and says, nope, no, no more. Um, because that's invariably what happens when they combine their efforts with the Ministry of Fisheries and everybody says, no, 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 no more than X numbers of fish. Um, we always moan about these uh, sort of rules and regulations, but it somehow seems that we carry on until those rules are basically put up and, and then suddenly we are uh, disgusted because somebody wants to police us. But if we are not policed, we somehow seem to abuse the system. Right, and then just uh, for one further time, fly and help. Um, you will remember that I brought up that uh, poster last week for the first time. So on 22nd of January 2022, there will be the stars under African skies and it's, it's organized by fly and help and uh, own L and uh, uh, Eurowings Discover and well obviously Allgemeine Zeitung and Hit Radio are assisting. Uh, but the point that I wanted to make this week is people don't really always understand like if you look at Fly and Help what do they do? They've already supported 76 educational projects in Namibia. Uh, this uh, 76 I must say uh, will be including those that will be finished in 2022. Uh, and of those, 47 are new schools. The rest were uh, additions to uh, existing fly and help schools. And uh, so for, for 2022, um, they have uh, set aside 4.28 million euros just for Namibia alone. So this is a worthy cause no matter how you look at it. And um, uh, the, the guy who's standing behind that is a, a person called Rainer uh, Moich. And he's been honored a number of times for his efforts. Uh, fly and help, he's literally flying around the world, collecting miles, getting sponsored to do it, um, having access to various artists uh, who perform free of charge. And whatever money is taken in is really just going towards those projects. It's huge. Uh, so if you want to look up fly and help in the internet, you'll quickly see this is not some Mickey Mouse game. This man is truly moving the world. So I thought it's worthwhile just talking about that as well. And uh, with that, we're already at the end of topics for this week. Uh, up next, we've got uh, destinations.
Yeah, destinations. And uh, this time we've got something different. Well, we're always trying to, to, to not always concentrate on the same items. Now, the what is called the Namibia Community Skills Development Foundation is not new in, in Namibia. And uh, here you find it, it's, uh, you know, if you look at the map as you come into Swakopmund, um, you basically use the turn off that goes to the airport or the skydiving club. And then immediately to your left again, you will have Kostev. So it's right at the outside of town. And um, so, so this thing is not new. It's a national umbrella body for the community skills development centers and in short COSDEC. So COSDEC uh, Swakop Munt was established in 2006 and it offers structured courses with job attachments and a variety of short courses to community members, including hospitality and tourism. And the COSDEC uh, principle itself is not new either and it's not unique to Swakop Munt. You find them in Ondangwa, um, Rundu, Tsumip, uh, Ochivarongo, and even Gubabis, if I remember correctly. So Leandria Lowe spoke uh, to Jessica Lechransi, the marketing coordinator of Kostev Arts and Crafts. If you look at the pictures, you will see there. Um, Jessica spoke about what the center has to offer and how it ties into tourism at, at the coastal town of Swakop Munt. She also talks about the festive season and the plans for the center. So if you have a look at the video, um, yeah, you will see what it is all about. And um, so welcome to Swakop Munt on a different uh, uh, point for a change. With me here is Jessica Legrancy, who is the marketing coordinator here at the Costev Arts and Crafts Center here in Swakopmund. Now you can't look past the Arts and Crafts Center when you come into Swakopmund. Big colorful building, you can't miss it. <laughs> exactly. Now but tell us, for the people that just see this colorful building, what happens here at the Costev Arts and Crafts Center? There's quite a lot actually happening here, but our main purpose is training the local community, um, community training and development. So we currently have five long courses that we run at the center of which three are accredited. So our accredited courses are jewelry design, um, fashion design and visual arts. Uh -huh. We've got two courses that's currently in the accreditation process which is gra uh, graphic design and leather. Um, and these courses are all one year and they're very affordable and after your one year you get an accredited certificate which is a level two um, certificate and then in jewelry and fashion design you can go further up to level three and then these courses can be a stepping stone for you when you want to further your studies for instance to college of the arts or um, UNAM certain certain fields um, so this is really a perfect opportunity for those guys that's not academically inclined yes. that's more practical because our courses are very practical um, and of course those guys that struggle in school and by grade 10 they decide they've had enough they want yeah. to <laughs> venture into different fields so then this is a perfect opportunity uh -huh. um, and all our courses does include um, entrepreneurship and business skills uh, numeracy basic numeracy and English in the workplace so the idea is that once you've finished your one year course with us you should be able to start your own business run your own business uh -huh. We also have what we call an incubation um, program, which we run at the center. Uh, we've got little units at the center where students can apply for and then use for a year um, as, as a business. So they move into the unit, we help them, we assist them with certain um, uh, skills and, and mentoring and marketing, teach them how to write business plans, how to market their things and sell their things. Um, and then, you know, so we're here as a support system. Exactly. People. So it's quite a yeah. lot happening. Yeah, it is a lot happening. Yeah. Now, uh, you also incorporate tourism into yes. the Arts and Crafts yeah. Centre. Please tell us a bit about that. So we also have a project called the Uyetu Craft and Mentoring Project, mm -hmm. which is a training project, outreach project that we do run throughout Namibia. We yes. currently have 12 groups that we have trained up to date or are busy training. 
um, and it's craft a group. So we teach and mentor these groups, we uh, do product development with these groups and then once they've got a product that's uh, sellable, yes. we bring it back to the centre and we sell it in our own shop but we also create opportunities for them to sell it um, to the rest of the public. We're for instance now working on an online shop for nice. specifically for these craft groups so that we can enter the international market. Um, and we strive to be purely Namibian. So our craft shop, which is the Uyetu craft shop uh, at the centre, has several uh, or is here to support local crafters. First of all, the Uyetu outreach group crafters, uh -huh. but then also other crafters throughout Namibia. Um, and we keep it purely Namibian. Awesome. Now, what, what can you find in the shop? What type of items? Well, it's anything you can think of. We've got <laughs> handmade jewelry, we've got baskets, wooden craft, you know, which you usually get uh, throughout Namibia. Um, and then we're also busy working on a range that's more for the local market. So mm -hmm. um, that's for like for uh, uh, bar, uh, like macrame, macrame. Yes, 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 <laughs> but I know, yeah. Uh, and Christmas decoration, of course, now is a big thing. Um, and we're busy with a range of macrame lights that you can hang up in your house. So we're trying now to enter the uh, local market because uh -huh. we're struggling a little bit like everyone else to get the tourists. But um, so hopefully by February next year, we should launch our local market. Oh, section. nice. <laughs> awesome. So what are the plans for December for the festive season here at the Arts December, and December, unfortunately, we are a bit quiet. We've got tomorrow, we've got our Christmas market, the 4th of December, um, where we also will have a very big sale in our shop to get rid of all the old stock. Yes. And we've got a whole load of interesting stalls coming, people coming to sell these craft goodies. Um, and then the rest of December, we're going to be quiet. Uh -huh. um, we are a bit in an odd place. Everyone, we are a bit outside of Stockholm, and everyone <laughs> flocks to the coast yes, and to the it's sea. True. So, um, in the past, we've tried several times to do functions here over December, but people prefer to be next to the beach uh -huh. in their swimming costumes. Yeah, that's sun. true. So now, we'll, yes. We'll, we'll be close. We're closing on the 15th of December and then we'll open again on the 4th of January. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, just finally, Jessica, um, we have a lot of tourists coming in. We've got a lot of locals coming in. What message would you like to give them just to boost our tourism industry but, and the arts and crafts center here? What message do you have for them? I would say support. Support locally, especially the crafters. And, you know, don't... People sometimes think the prices are so expensive, but mm. remember these things are handmade. Exactly. It's not doesn't come from a factory, it's not mass produced. It's a massive amount of time and energy and creativeness that goes into these products. Exactly. Products. Support them, buy them. And that doesn't only go for the tourists, it goes for us locals as well. Mm -hmm. Support That's your true. local guys. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, thanks. That was Kostev, um, as you could uh, deduce from the pictures and the video, quite a very interesting place to go to um, and where you can also get hold of a couple of, um, of, of different uh, types of products, um, all tourism related obviously, but even for locals because you get handbags and everything that you can think of and I think it's uh, worth, worth our while to support these guys um, because at least they are looking for an alternative solution. Right, and then up next we've got Kifaru Lodge. Um, so um, Kifaru Lodge is, is found at, at Uchu. Um, if you look at the map there, it's, uh, Uchu is that where the roads come together here at the bottom. And then from Uchu, uh, basically as you leave the town past the industrial site, um, I would think it's the road that leads to Otavi. Then you've got Kifaru Lodge as you go through that plain there. Very nice area. I've been to it. And um, as they say on the internet site, our safari paradise uh, offers guests the opportunity to immerse themselves in utter tranquility. Embraced by the beautiful bushveld and exquisite African sunsets, Kifaru offers an atmosphere of exclusivity and seclusion. So um, the video that we are going to show you uh, was prepared by Tanya Bause and let's have a look at it. Um, my name is Jakub Muller. Um, I'm the owner of Kifaru Lodge. Um, we situated in the Kunini region of uh, close to Ochu, Namibia. Um, we uh, built our lodge finished uh, end of November 2019. 
So we were really bad luck with the COVID. Uh, we haven't had a season at all. Um, we kept our place open, um, but obviously we didn't have a lot of guests. Um, the reason why we started uh, the lodge, um, we are also involved in the Rhino Mama project. Um, that's the largest white rhino breeding project in Namibia. Um, and it's, it's not really sustainable to breed with rhinos. And for that reason, we, we decided to, um, to start going into tourism to help um, finance this rhino project. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that, that's our aim and our vision is, is to, to help protect rhinos. The, the name of our lodge is also Kifaru. It's, it's Swahili for rhino. What, what do you all offer tourists here? Why should they come here? Um, we, we have quite a, a range of, of activities. Um, obviously, our scenery um, is, is really nice, the, the Mupani bushveld. Um, we've got a lot of uh, the normal planes game that you get in Namibia, basically all the types of planes game that you get in Namibia. Um, and we also uh, have uh, white and black rhinos. Um, so we offer like uh, ga normal game drives. Yeah, we also do um, rhino tracking on foot. Um, and then we have a unicorn brunch um, where the guests go, they go on a morning game drive and then in the around brunch time, which is about 10 o'clock, uh, we, we make them brunch in the felt. Uh, normally they work rhinos in the vicinity that you can see while you having your brunch. Do you have camping places or is it only chalets? We, we unfortunately at the moment don't offer camping. We do have a bush camp, uh, what we call a bush camp. It's, it's also a, a lodge where we have 12 rooms um, and um, it's, it's, it's a bit cheaper than, than the luxury lodge where we are now. So the luxury lodge has six rooms and as you will see on the pictures, it's it's a really upmarket luxury lodge. Yeah, we uh, so so at both at the bush camp and at the lodge, we we have swimming pools, um, and we also offer um, t t not really sp uh, professional spa treatments, but our girls are trained to to give the the ladies, especially like a foot massage and and stuff like that. Um, tell me quickly about the. Rhino Mama project. Okay, the, so the, the, the mission and vision of the Rhino Mama project is to, to breed as uh, many as possible uh, rhino calves, white rhinos specifically, to repopulate Namibia but, but also Africa. We've, we have exported rhinos to Angola, DRC, um, and uh, the rest were all sold in Namibia. Um, Yes, so the mission is to, to breed as many as possible calves so that we can repopulate the country with rhinos. When did this project start? Um, 2010 was our, when we bought our very first rhino. Our first calf was born uh, January 2013 and up till now there's been more than 100 calves that's been born here. Um, what we do, uh, we do dehorn all our rhinos. Um, some people are against that but for their own safety it's best for them um, we have full-time anti-poaching 24 7 and we also have um, air surveillance with a gyrocopter and drones um, so we have a team um, 24 7 uh, looking after them all our prices um, at Kifaru if you go to the bush camp or the or the luxury lodge is dinner bed and breakfast so um, you obviously still have to pay for your drinks and then for lunch, but it includes a, a dinner, bed and breakfast. Uh, the activities are also extra. Um, and we can even take you on a agricultural tour. To, to We have a lucerne field uh, where, we, where we produce um, alfalfa or lucerne as we call it, um, to, as feed for our animals. Every year in the dry season, from about October, we need to feed the animals. Um, it's just like an extra feed. There's like this year, there's more than enough grazing left, but you do um, just give them that little bit of extra to, to keep them 
fit and uh, and uh, it, it helps with with um, their fertility as well. If if there's just always plenty of food for them. In 2019, of course, we had a terrible drought and we had to feed the whole year. At the end of that year, we fed up to two tons every single day. Yeah, that was Kifaru Lodge for you, something different for you for a change. All about uh, panoramic views and, and, and then the, the reserve and whatever. So um, those are destinations for this week. Uh, up next, we've got to the point. Yeah, I think by now all of you know what I feel about, uh, or how I feel about the travel bans and travel restrictions to uh, Southern African countries. For one or another reason, you've got this huge wide world out there and everybody is allowed to manage uh, COVID to their best ability, but Southern Africa needs to be banned uh, from any access to the world. Uh, while all, all types of uh, virus mutations have continuously uh, run around the whole world and by the time you discover them, it's long past the point where you can still uh, sort of control them and keep them in one place. So I personally am a very big critic of these travel bans, um, especially because there must be a hundred places out in the world that have less control over this stuff and especially with South Africa having the ability to actually determine and establish uh, new mutations, uh, I would think it's totally laughable that you're being punished for the fact that you tell the world about uh, a new um, mutant or a new version of COVID like the Omicron uh, virus. Anyway, Ilani Smith spoke to Gitta Petzold of uh, the Hospitality Association of Namibia and uh, they had a talk about, talk about the travel ban. Yeah, unfortunately, the end of November was both a very exciting time for Namibia because we had just concluded the October figures of um, tourism occupations or occupancies in our hotels and lodges and saw that it doubled up on the 2020 demise. Um, we're not quite there yet because currently with a 34% occupancy in our accommodation establishments in October, we were halfway of where we used to be in 2019 and under normal circumstances. But things were looking up and then came the announcement first by the United Kingdom and that was very quickly followed by the rest of the world almost, um, especially the EU and um, the United States of America and other countries, that they would ban travel to Southern Africa because the Omicron virus or variant was found um, or first identified by South African um, scientists. Um, we were shell-shocked. I mean, that was completely unexpected and we still feel that it was unfair because you know having identified the virus doesn't mean the virus originates in that country. We've seen that before. Last year in this time we were almost in a very similar position where Beta was first discovered in, in Southern Africa or by South African scientists and um, the region was stigmatized in terms of you know the danger of COVID in, in a particular part of the world. Um, we've seen things move very quickly last week and for the first time, I think some of the African voices became very loud, um, stating that this kind of knee-jerk reaction that was taken by uh, world leaders was unfair. It's completely contrary to what they have discussed at levels um, from the G7 to the G20. Even at COP26, they said the world must take hands and work as a team to fight this pandemic. And all of a sudden, just because of a panic-stricken announcement of one new variant, they actually punish one part of, of the world. And calling a travel ban for Southern Africa is basically um, yeah, sabotaging our economic recovery. Tourism um, is a very important economic sector, not only for Namibia, but also for Southern Africa, and especially for South Africa and the UK market. It was almost a death knell um, in the coffin of, of South African tourism in last week. Um, it's very pleasing to hear that both the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, and our own president, and he repeated that message again this week, um, said this travel ban needs to be lifted almost immediately because there's no scientific reason for, for that travel ban. Um, and 
you know, the, the rest of the world seems to have had that virus even before it was identified by South African scientists. So actually we should have seen the world praise and, and applaud the South African scientists and not punish us for, for having gone that far as to provide that kind of information for the world scientists to, to work on. Luckily, we've also seen, um, and I believe that the United States has just come out with, with information through Dr. Fauci that um, Omicron is proving more and more to be a very mild um, virus and mutations have mutated so, so vigilantly that it's actually weakened the virus. And that just could cause some kind of, you know, the coronavirus fizzling out at some point. That's what happened with the Spanish flu 100 years ago. So maybe we are in a good way, but at the moment, um, Southern Africa is suffering. I do know that there were immediate cancellations of some of the major tour operators, be it Deltour, Tui, um, Icarus, um, most of the big, big tour operators immediately cancelled their scheduled tours, not only for this week or this month, but have cancelled until January of 2022. So we have lost millions, multiple millions in, in bookings. And things were actually looking up at some point. I spoke to a tour operator here in Namibia just before the end of November, and he said that his bookings for December, January was 200% up on the bookings of 2019, which means we were up on normal circumstances, never mind the 2020 demise. Um, so things were really looking positive. I believe also in South Africa, um, they had really good, good indications for, for an upsurge in tourism for the festive season, um, December, January being a high season for South Africa. Not so much so for Namibia, we do have a lot of um, domestic and regional tourism in December, January here in, in Namibia, um, but also our international bookings were looking up and that obviously came crashing down. Um, we have been informed by our international um, partners that there are discussions to revert that kind of decision taken, I would also know that our Ministry of International Relations did take um, the matter up with, with counterparts in other countries. Um, the matter is under review at the moment, but I think the damage is done. Um, Cancelled bookings will not be reopened very soon. And what it has done is basically reconfirmed the anxiety, reconfirmed the insecurity of travel and the volatility of the tourism sector. People are now almost too scared to make bookings a month or two in advance um, because we saw it last week how quickly decisions get taken that have huge consequences on our industry and that's the problem that we tourists are facing with. Namibia has done everything right, we were on a very good path, um, our COVID situation is very well controlled, praise to the Namibian government and its people for having done what we did um, and still we are suffering so that's almost the most paralytic, the, the paralyzing feeling that we have at the moment. We've done everything that we needed to do, um, and yet, you know, we are where we are at the moment. In terms of what we can do to salvage, obviously sound out the message that we are safe, we are sound, we are doing what is necessary, um, and that Namibia and Southern Africa is a safe destination to travel to. We've got the beautiful weather, we've got the wide open spaces. One call that should go out even louder and stronger to the Namibia nation, especially, is for them to vaccinate because that seems to be the call that the international community is, is calling out on. Um, Botswana has done it, they've reached a vaccination percentage of over 60%, I think they're at 64% at the moment. South Africa is also going very well. Um, here in Namibia we have to pull up our socks um, because that's, despite all the arguments and, and you know different opinions, that is what the international travel trade needs because they feel that that is one of the measures that we can put in place to limit transmission of the virus and severity. It's, it's basically part of the safety protocol. Um, and if we want to have tourism feed our economy and feed our people, we need to abide by, by the international expectation for um, herd immunity to be established also through vaccinations. Yes, and that was Gita Petzold, like I said, of Han. Um, share our view, don't share. Um, you, you're more than welcome to have a comment on the, after the show on, on our Facebook page. But like I said, I'm not much of a believer in that what happens right now is the right way to handle COVID in, over the long run. By simply shutting down the world, you're shutting down people who earn less than most of the world and um, you're basically making sure that poverty has a good chance to to be in this country for a very long time 
That's my opinion. Like I said, very critical of this whole thing. But that brings us to the end of our show for this week. I hope you enjoyed it a little. And um, this was our second last show. There will still be one more show where after we'll be shutting down for the festive season into January when we'll be back. Just a heads up so that you know. Um, thank you for viewing the show and hopefully I'll see you one last time next week. Same place, same time. Until then, look after yourself and remain healthy.